you with us tonight, but now uh, what we've been waiting for, uh, while we've been preparing for this, we're thrilled to be able to have with us, uh, as everyone knows, the opportunity to uh, hear from one of the great lawyers of our generation, uh, Robbie Kaplan, who's a partner at Paul Weiss, and in her efforts representing Edie Windsor, has, has thread, has been, we've been watching her thread a needle. As a lawyer, she's had to organize all different community organizations, all different kinds of efforts to, to support it, so in the community there would be great support. And last Yom Kippur, when you were at services, there were many cases in front of the Supreme Court, and we did not yet know which one, or ones, as it turned out there were two, would be chosen, and if any. And so uh, when we saw you on Yom Kippur, we did not yet know that this would become the Supreme Court case it did. And we're thrilled that you're here, of course, with your partner, Rachel, and we send greetings and love to Jacob at home. And we're hoping he's having a great time with his cousin and having a terrific time and, uh, away from this crowd. So we want to send him our love and greetings from CBST. And it is my honor, our privilege as a congregation, to, as I said at the, at the, uh, at the rally on Wednesday, it's not just two New York lesbians who brought down DOMA. It's two New York Jewish lesbians. <laughs> And so, my friends, how, what an incredible honor it is to welcome to our BIMA, Robbie Kaplan. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> if it's okay with you, I would like to spend some time this evening talking about the fundamental change that I believe led to the Supreme Court's historic landmark ruling two days ago in Edie Windsor versus the United States of America. Change at the level of the individual change within our nation, and change in both secular and Jewish law. Perhaps the dominant view in our popular culture today is that religion or belief in God is inimical to the concept of change. That, after all, is the sense that one gets when one hears the media talk about Christian evangelicals, that they preach a vision of life and law that cannot tolerate any deviation from the explicit biblical text. The same, of course, is true within Judaism. Not only do certain groups of ultra-Orthodox Jews hold a similar theory about Jewish law, or halakha, but some even refuse to tolerate change in even the most mundane circumstances. For example, by refusing to use the internet, or by insisting on wearing a particular type of hat in today's Jerusalem that their ancestors wore in 17th century Ukraine. The very idea that I, as a woman, not to mention a lesbian, am standing on this bima talking to you tonight would be utterly inconceivable to them. But what I hope to be able to demonstrate to you tonight is that that is not the only way to be religious or to believe in God. And it certainly is not the proper interpretation of our tradition. Inherent in Jewish belief is the view that people, communities, and even the law must and should change when times and ethical circumstances require it. Indeed, both the Torah and the rabbis taught that such change is a positive halachic value. Let me start at the level of the individual. That is perhaps the easiest argument to make in the context of Judaism. 
After all, a few, a few weeks from now, we will be starting the month of Elul, the month leading up to the High Holy Days. Uh, when, during that month, positive change and growth is not only encouraged at the level of the individual, but is a positive commandment. Each morning that month, we blow the shofar, just as we heard at the beginning of our service. Maimonides described this custom of blowing the shofar as a wake-up call to sleepers, designed to rouse us from complacency, to grow and to change. It's like a kind of spiritual alarm clock. And in the context of a certain Jewish lady by the name of Edie Windsor, there is no doubt that the change that she experienced thus far in her 84 years, from getting married to and then quickly divorced from a male family friend in the early 1950s, to meeting Thea Spire in 1963 and falling in love with her, to becoming engaged in 1967, to dealing as a couple with Thea's multiple sclerosis, to ultimately getting married and coming out to everyone in her life in 2007, was and continues to be what has brought us to this great day. Indeed, without such change, Edie never could have become, and I'm using her words, the out lesbian who just happens to be suing the United States of America. <laughs> In terms of change at the level of the community, that is also pretty obvious. Every Shabbat, after all, we read the Torah. And after reading the Torah, we read the Haftorah, Torah, which includes the poetry of the prophets, encouraging, even demanding, change on the part of the nation of Israel. That, after all, is what prophets like Amos or Isaiah were all about. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel has written that the prophet was an individual who said no to his society, condemning its habits and assumptions, its complacency. It is no coincidence that Rabbi Heschel's book on the prophets inspired Martin Luther King and that they worked closely together during the African American Civil Rights Movement. In terms of our community within Judaism, there also can be little question that we have seen such change firsthand even in the past year. Among other things, the Jewish Theological Seminary, for the first time in its entire history, submitted an amicus brief in a court case. Which case, one might ask? Edie Windsor versus the United States of America. When JTS, along with the entire conservative movement, and one Orthodox rabbi joined an amicus brief urging the Supreme Court to strike down DOMA as unconstitutional. Think about that for a moment. Less than 10 years ago, any gay rabbi ordained at JTS had to be in the closet. Today, JTS signed on to a brief at the United States Supreme Court arguing that the marriages of gay people should be respected under the law. That's an incredible amount of change. And I certainly don't have to tell you guys that we have seen the same kind of dramatic change in our nation as well. According to a Gallup poll last month, 53% of Americans say that same-sex marriages should be recognized. A more recent poll from ABC had that number at 58%. The current level of support is essentially double the 27% in Gallup's initial poll in 1996 when DOMA was signed into law. And we are now on the verge of electing an open lesbian as the next mayor of the city of New York. that has taken place even in the context of Edie Windsor's court case is illustrative of this phenomenon. When we filed our case in 2009, New York State did not permit gay couples to marry. That is why Edie and Thea, along with four best women and two best men, had to go to Toronto to get married. 
In 2011, New York passed its own marriage statute, making it at the time only the sixth state in the country to grant gay people the freedom to marry. This past March, when I argued the case before the United States Supreme Court, nine states plus the District of Columbia permitted gay couples to marry. And this evening, only three months later, months later 13 states do, including the state of California. And those numbers will only continue to grow. But where the proverbial rubber hits the road is change in the law. The question of whether and to what extent Jewish law can change is probably the central debate that divides Jews today and in the past. And that brings me to this week's Torah portion, Parshat Pinchas, which contains the story of the, of the daughters of Slofahad, and thus I believe explicitly makes the case that Jewish law is subject to change in accordance with the dictates of fairness, justice, and ethical compassion. Let me explain. The daughters of Slofahad were five sisters whose father died during the 40 years that the Jews were wandering in the desert after the escape from Egypt. According to God's prior decree, the land of Israel was to be apportioned according to the numbers of names counted in the census. That was in Numbers 26. Since only men were counted in that census, Zlofahad's daughters literally didn't count and could not receive any inheritance from their father. As a result, Zlofahad's daughters came forward to petition Moses and the priests for their right to inherit their father's property. As they explained, why should our father's name be eliminated from his family because he has no son? Moses then, of course, took their case to the Supreme Court of the Torah, God, who told Moses that the plea of Slofahad's daughters was just and that they should receive their inheritance. God also told Moses to change the rule going forward so that if a man dies and has no son, you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. This legal rule, preferring men over women with respect to inheritance, was changed later as well. The book of Job, which dates from the fourth century, states that Job's daughters were given equal inheritance rights to Job's sons. By the Middle Ages, the inequality between daughters and sons was avoided by a legal mechanism, something I specialize in, by which the father claimed that he was indebted to his daughter for a certain sum of money and that this debt was due to him was due to her by him or his heirs. As a result, the daughter would gain a share in her father's estate. Um, and there are numerous other examples, of course, of the rabbis insisting on an ethical reading of a biblical prescription when it comes to the actual execution of the law, particularly when dealing with the circumstances of people's lives. I bet you know where I'm headed by now. The notion that Jewish law is fixed in stone unbending and unyielding, and not subject to change, is simply not consistent with the story of Zlofahad's daughters. It is not consistent with the text of the Torah, with God's actions, or with Moses' words. After all, it is God himself who changed God's own prior rule when God saw the justice in the daughter's argument. And it surely isn't consistent with the actions of the rabbis centuries later when recognizing the inherent dignity of women, they gave them equal inheritance rights under Jewish law. This same dynamic, but this time in the context of American constitutional law, was at play in my now famous exchange with Chief Justice John Roberts during oral arguments in the Windsor case on March 27th. That exchange involved a debate about what really has been driving the dramatic transformation and American attitudes about gay people. The Chief Justice suggested that Americans were following the lead of elected officials. He asked me the following question. I suppose the sea change has a lot to do with the political effectiveness of people supporting your side of the case. I responded by explaining my view that the, that the change was instead one of ethical perception. 
the result of an understanding that there is no fundamental difference that could justify categorical discrimination between gay couples and straight couples. And then the Chief Justice pushed it further, noting that as far as I can tell, political figures are falling over themselves to endorse your side of the case. My answer then and my answer today is the same. What truly has driven the change we all have experienced is not the so-called political power of gay people, but instead a moral understanding today that gay people are no different and that gay married couples' relationships are not significantly different from the relationships of straight married couples. I am thrilled. <laughs> I am thrilled, honored, and delighted to be able to tell you tonight that the Supreme Court ultimately agreed with me. what Justice Kennedy had to say in his opinion. Until recent years, many citizens of this country had not even considered the possibility that two persons of the same sex might aspire to occupy the same status and dignity as that of a man and woman in lawful marriage. DOMA is invalid because no legitimate purpose overcomes the purpose and effect to disparage and to injure those whom the state by its marriage laws, sought to protect, and here's the crucial part, in personhood and in dignity. That is the kind of change, the kind of tikkun olam, or repair of the world, that lies at the heart of our tradition. It is, I believe, what God commands of every individual, every community, even the law, even of God. So where does all this leave us? I think the best way for me to sum up on this historic, joyous Pride Shabbat in the year 5773 is with Edie's own words on the steps of the Supreme Court when she was asked to explain why such dramatic change has taken place. I think what happened is at some point, somebody came out and said, I'm gay. And this gave other people the guts to do it. Amazingly, Rabbi Heschel said almost exactly the same thing years before when he wrote that all it takes is one person and another and another and another to start a movement. In the context... <laughs> in the context of both our community and our great nation, from Selma to Stonewall, from Rosa Parks to Harvey Milk to Edie Windsor, both Rabbi Heschel and Edie Windsor could not have been more correct. Thank you very much. Introduction, Edie Windsor. I think I'll be much more brief because she's the smart one. Okay. Uh, truly, uh, they could not have decided otherwise. And, you know, and I, I tried to explain it. I just said, she is reasoned and informed, and nobody could beat it. She was wonderful, and you just heard it. <laughs> um, 
I, I want to say something else. It, it is, I wrote this just to my LGBT community. In the course of the two and a half years of my case, the gay and lesbian community have affected the thinking and feeling of large numbers of our straight countrymen who have come to see us as human beings who live in love as they do and who bring up kids who will play with their kids. We, we ourselves have come out in increasing numbers and we see each other and we love each other differently and more. We really began to build our community during the AIDS epidemic, uh, when of course we all joined together for the first time. Then came the aftermath of Stonewall, and then this coming out in increasing numbers in our open fight for equality. What a way to survive the loss of fear. What a life I have. Full of love and community and joy. Thea would be so pleased. And tonight, uh, I want to take a further step for community, for in, my, in my embrace of community, and, and I want to join CBST. Okay. <laughs> to this lifetime agnostic. And I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> I want everyone to just notice this beautiful pin that Edie is wearing. That when she and Thea became engaged in 1967, Edie, who is a math whiz and a computer whiz working at IBM, couldn't wear an engagement ring to work because she couldn't withstand the kinds of questioning about who it was from, what it was about. And so Thea gave her this very, very beautiful engagement pin instead. And she wears it to this day. It's so beautiful. So to Edie Windsor, we say we love you, Edie.